Harwood Presbyterian Church. Please take a minute and sign the pew pad that's located at the end of the pew to let us know you're here. If you're fully vaccinated, feel free to not wear a mask. However, if you're fully vaccinated and feel that you're still at risk for any reason and wish to wear a mask, you're most welcome to do so. If you have not been fully vaccinated, both the CDC and the state of Virginia direct that you must continue to wear a mask in public. Our session worship committee and safety team, all made up of church members, just like you all, have volunteered their time to come up with a plan for us to safely return to worship here in the sanctuary. They have also spent a great deal of time, effort, and energy to prepare for reopening of the sanctuary. Today, we will be taking things one step at a time, and we continue to make adjustments next week and in future weeks. Today, we will invite you to say our call to worship responsibly out loud. We also invite you to say out loud in unison all of our prayers and statement of faith. Since singing is one of the riskier things we can do, we are only inviting you to sing the last two hymns along with Laura out loud. The first two hymns will be, we would like you to sing to yourself silently. Please see the two important announcements in the bulletin. We are once again in need of ushers and nursery workers. If you're willing to volunteer in this way, please contact the church office. Also, the food pantry is in need of jelly, peanut butter, pasta sauce, and corn. The collection box is located in the heritage room behind us. And are we, we're not going to put it back out on the porch. I'm just Okay, we're going to do two collections, so out here or in the porch. Um, and please note, too, that the mission outreach meeting this Wednesday is at 2 o'clock, not 1.30 as the bulletin states. And anyone is welcome to attend, and it will be in the heritage room. And now it's time to ring the bell.
morning's call to confession is from the book of Jeremiah, chapter 10, <coughs> verses 23 through 24. I know, Lord, that our lives are not our own. We are not able to plan our own course, so correct me, Lord, but please be gentle. Do not correct me in anger, for I would die. And now, with tried and humble hearts, let us make our prayer of confession. Together, let us pray. Holy God, Prince of Peace, we come to you confessing that we have desired revenge. We want others to pay for what they have done. We want others to suffer who have caused us to suffer. Forgive us for not wanting to walk in your ways. Forgive us for not wanting to forgive, for not wanting to restore, for not wanting to renew. Forgive us for holding on to anger and bitterness rather than recognizing our own brokenness and our need for restoration. In the name of the one who teaches us, we pray. Amen. Please take a moment for quiet reflection.
this would be like a designer there. And what would he be like? Well, maybe he would be different for each one. So you'll listen, hopefully, this morning to what my designer there would look like. First of all, he would be a loving there. And he would make no bones about showing me, his child, how much he cared for me. And this would come from his kindness, which was a result of his love for me, so that I would feel constantly engulfed in this overpowering love. The next thing I want from my dad would be acceptance, so that no matter what I was or how I thought about things, if it differed from what he expected or from what he thought, he would still accept. He would listen to me because of his loving and caring for me. The next thing I would want from my dad would be protection. I would want him to be looking out Keeping me safe, helping me make good decisions in life, even when I was small, and even more so when I got older, I would want his guidance as part of this protection. And the list could go on and on, I know. But the last thing that I would want, and certainly not the least important, would be a forgiving dad. I would want to know that no matter how badly I screwed up, and we all did, and I did, that he would not just reprimand me, but that he would be totally forgiving and accepting of me. That when I did wrong, when I spoke wrongly, that he would be there, no matter how bratty I was, how much chaos I was calling, and what a big mess I made of things, I had somebody there who would say, boy, you really screwed this up, but we're going to put it right, and I'm going to help you do that. So if if I had all of these things, love and acceptance and protection and forgiveness, I would think that I had pretty much a perfect day. Well, we all do have a perfect day. And that's the good news. He checks all the boxes. He's been with us first breath we took. And if we let him and we invite him, he's going to be right there with us till the end of our days. He loves us. He cares for us. He accepts us. He protects us. And he forgives us every day of our life, no matter what. He's your and my heavenly father, and we are his child. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for our earthly days, and thank you for being our heavenly father. We are grateful for the love and the caring, for the acceptance and protection, and we are especially thankful for the forgiveness that you show by showering us with so many blessings and with your grace. Thank you for setting the example of what a father, a designer father, should be. Amen. Will you join me as we pray for illumination? Blessed Lord, who caused all holy scriptures 
the ability to hear them, read them, learn, and inwardly digest them, that we may embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life, which you have given us in our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Our Old Testament lesson comes from the book of Proverbs, chapter 4, verses 1 through 5. Listen, my son, to a father's discipline, and pay attention so that you may gain understanding, for I am giving you good instruction. Don't abandon my teaching. When I was a son with my father, tender and precious to my mother, he taught me and said, your heart must hold on to my words, keep my commands, and live. Get wisdom. Get understanding. Don't forget or turn away from the words of my master. Our New Testament reading comes from the book of Romans, chapter 8, verses 12 through 17. So then, brothers, we are not obligated to the flesh to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you are going to die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. All those led by God's Spirit are God's sons. For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you received the spirit of adoption, by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies together with our spirit that we are God's children, and the children also heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, seeing that we suffer with him, so that we may always also be glorified with him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Happy Father's Day to all the dads out here. And uh, but what is Father's Day? <clears throat> One child gave this explanation. It's just like Mother's Day, only you don't spend as much on the present. <laughs> <laughs> when Pastor asked me to give this sermon last month, I quickly responded, "Sure, I got this. I've got over three weeks to put a good message together, no problem." As I started working on this last night, I realized that there was some pretty powerful stuff in the Bible about having a father, being a father, and God, the perfect father. So my goal is to make this message his, backed up with applicable Bible verses, plenty of bad dad jokes, and before we begin, I do have a confession to make. I used to be addicted to Hokey Pokey. But I turned myself around. <laughs> Bad dad jokes. You've been warned. So having a father. I have to admit that this was the toughest one for me to get my head around because there are so many verses that describe being a father, but not the context of having a father. You have good fathers, bad fathers, the fatherless, and all in between. So I'll begin this way. For those that know me, know that I love my family, I love my church, I work hard, I have no patience, I'm a little cranky, I work as hard as I can on something that I truly believe in because I do believe that it's our responsibility and duty to give back to the community that provides everything that, to our families that I can. Well, I pretty much just introduced you to my father, Larry Pritchard. This is what he taught me. Like my father, I know many of you have similar stories of a great dad. I also know that we all have stories where we think our dad weren't so great. In Hebrews 11, Abraham, Isaac, Moses, Jacob, Samuel, and David were called heroes of faith by God. Lot was called righteous in 2 Peter, and in Galatians 3, so was Abraham. David was called a man after God's own heart in Acts. David was perhaps the most important man in the Old Testament but he was the worst father of the bunch. And the rest of these guys were terrible fathers. They cast out family, 
promoted sibling rivalry to the point that God's grace, that, that without God's grace would have ended in death. They played favorites. They raised and condoned ungodly children. They loved their children above God himself. And there's even worse that you can read about in the chapter of Genesis. These guys really messed up their parenting, but God knew their hearts. In Samuel, Kings, Luke, and Acts, they all state, God, he knows the hearts of all men. We all make mistakes. He can fix them and work through them. In Romans 8, 28, it says, we know that all things work together for good, them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. We need to trust this. The first of the four Ten Commandments deal with our relationship with God. The remaining six instruct us about our relationship with our fellow human beings. In Exodus 20, verse 12, the first of these human relationship commands reads, Honor your mother and father, that your days may be long in a land which the Lord your God gives you. The reason God includes this in his commands is that it runs against our human nature. Our tendency is to fight authority, whether it be authority of God or authority over our parents. We want to be free. We want to do our own thing. So I found this little piece titled Father, which will sum up this portion of having a father. When you're four years old, my daddy can do anything. When you're eight years old, my father doesn't quite know everything. When you're 14 years old, father, hopelessly old-fashioned. 21 years old, oh, that man is out of date. But what do you expect? 25 years old, he knows a little bit about it, eh, but not that much. 30 years old, eh, I need to find out what dad thinks about that. 35 years old, a little patience. Let's get dad's meeting, let's see what he thinks. 50 years old. What would my dad have thought about it? 60 years old. Man, my dad knew pretty much everything. And then at some point, we're all gonna be, boy, I wish I could talk it over with my dad once more. All of these thoughts over the same guy makes you think, huh? So, being a father, found some 10 points that I wanna share with you guys. One, be your child's first teacher. Proverbs 22.6, it says, Train up a child in the way that he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. For example, as I'm sure Laura learned with her gift of song, singing in the shower is fun until you get soap in your mouth. Yeah. Then it's a soap opera. <laughs> Bad joke. I warned you. All right. It's our responsibility to train up a child in the way he or she should go, not the schools, not the governments, but you, and that starts with you, Dad. Our teaching should begin with children to their young age in church. Kids then gain knowledge, like being able to explain, where do you learn to make a banana split? Naturally, Sunday school, right? <laughs> so in Psalm 78, Deuteronomy 6, and so many Bible passages tell us to teach our children as we sit down, as we stand up, as we walk along, as we lie down, to pass on from one generation to the next, I'm sorry, passing from one generation to the next the instructions of God. As a good father instructs his children, so too God wants to instruct us. Instruction carries with it criticisms and corrections, two things none of us like, but all of us need. Instruction also carries with it the obligation of obedience. If one does not obey, how can they learn? Get wisdom, and to get that, sometimes it takes pains to get it. An example is for an athlete to grow strong, there must be sacrifice and pain. So too, we are, so too are we to be spiritual athletes who will suffer pain for the greater good. It is also so important to watch our words towards our children and our families. In Ephesians 4.29, the Apostle Paul challenges us, do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but it is only what helpful, but only what is helpful for building up others according to their needs that may benefit those who listen. Number two, dads need to exemplify a good life. Once Alex was born, I knew I had a lot of bad habits to shower off, and it caused me to become addicted to soap, but I'm clean now. So. That's pretty bad. I got more. All right, 
so uh, one way to exemplify a good life is stated in 2 Corinthians 3, verse 2 and 3. You yourselves are letter, are our letter, written on our hearts, known and read by everyone. You show that you are a letter from Christ, the result of our ministry, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human hearts. Scripture teaches us that who we are and teaches us. Not used to being up here because it's a little tough time. It's a little overwhelming, and I apologize. Scripture teaches us who we are and how we live is like a letter of God. Our kids read that letter every day. And blessed are the righteous, children of the righteous. Righteousness not only righteousness doesn't necessarily lead to wealth and prosperity, but it does change the way we respond to our circumstances and how we perceive us. The fathers who pursue righteousness won't find himself in compromising positions or being embarrassment to his children. Rather, he'll provide his children with a model worth following, and his righteousness will change the other way to treat his family. As said in Proverbs 20, verse 7, the righteous lead blameless lives. Blessed are their children after them. Number three, and this is one that I really think is important, is dad needs to love mom. Um, in Ephesians 5, 22, verse 29, and I'm going to paraphrase this because this is a whole lesson in itself. For the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church, his body of which he is Savior. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. For who loves his wife loves himself. Personally, these are the primary verses that I believe with all of my being that God gave me a great marriage with Terry. When Terry and I disagreed, argued, or whatever, even if I didn't think I was wrong, which most of the time I wasn't, I believe, <laughs> I did believe, though, it was ultimately my responsibility with a lot of prayer to figure out how to find a loving resolution. I didn't do, always do a great job with this, but believing these verses kept me working at it. In simple terms, I believe that with all the submitting of the wife here, the ultimate submission lies with the husband. Christ served and died for all of us that make up this church. He took responsibility for our sins and saved us. So, dads, I believe that's the attitude we need to have toward our wives and the example we require, are required to teach our family. Your children are learning from you about how to treat their wives. One day, they will treat their wives the same way you treated their mother. Number four, provide for your family. In 1 Timothy 5.8, but if any provide not for his own, especially those of his own house, he hath denied the faith and is worth in an infidel. I believe this reference is more about your heart desire. Being a father, being a father just isn't providing food and rent. As dads, it's our responsibility to make sure our family's needs are addressed across the board. Dads also need to discipline their children. Prior to discipline, direction must be given though. Similar to, what do you call cheese that isn't yours? Natural cheese. <laughs> Clear direction, right? Natural cheese. So in Hebrews 12, 10 through 11, it states, Our fathers disciplined us for little as they thought best. But God disciplines us for our good, that we may share his holiness. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. I recently heard a story about triple kids, three young boys who got along well. They saw everything alike. They were loyal to each other. If one got into trouble, they wouldn't tattle on each other. A neighbor asked the father, how in the world do you know which one to punish if there's trouble? He said, that's easy. I just sent all three to bed without supper. And then the next morning, I spanked the one with the black eye. <laughs> all, all kidding aside, it says in Galatians, it says in Colossians 3.21, when discipline is required, do it constructively and with love. Discipline also requires compassion. In Psalm 103, verse 13, as a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. Number six, dad need to spend time with their children, and it's not empty time. But whatever you do, avoid this scenario. What did baby corn say to mama corn? Where's popcorn? Don't be where's popcorn, okay? 
In Deuteronomy 6, verses 6 through 9, these commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them upon your children. Talk about them when you sit at home, when you walk along the road, when you lie, when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on door frames of your houses and on your gates. These scriptures are clear that dads must engage with their children in that kind of deep heart-to-heart -heart conversations that impart more than facts but teach wisdom. Schedule some type of regular conversational walks or whatever it may be with your children one-on-one. -on -one. Family time that counts. Don't miss your children's childhood. There's no second chance at childhood. Number seven, put your money where your mouth is. What do you call an elephant that doesn't matter? Irrelevant. <laughs> Don't be irrelevant. Okay? In James 1.22, it says, Do not merely listen to the word, and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. So not those exact words, but it basically instructs us to not only be hearers, but to be doers of God's work as well. Your children need to see your faith. Uh, in Proverbs 14.26, Whoever fears the Lord has a skirt has a secure fortress and for their children will be a refuge. When families face hardships, children look to their parents for reassurance and hope. If a father respects and submits to God in all things, his faith will be a source, source of comfort for his children and help them feel secure regardless of whatever storm life brings up against them. Number eight, don't provoke your children. What do you call a belt made of watches? A waste of time. <laughs> in Colossians 3.21, fathers, provoke not your children to anger lest they be discouraged. <clears throat> in Ephesians 6.4, any fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in nurture and in admi admonition of the Lord. So basically, our job is to encourage, not to discourage. Number nine, dads never give up on their kids. But first, how many lips do flowers have? Two, Two lips. Very good. <laughs> good All right. God saw these things, saw things in his children, what his children can do. He encouraged them to do them and go out and do them. God encouraged Moses at the burning bush when he told him to deliver the nation of Israel. He encouraged Joshua as Joshua set out to conquer the promised land. He encouraged them with his words, his presence, and his assistance. In Joshua 1 9, have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be terrified. Do not be discouraged. The Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. And then in the story of the prodigal son, in Luke 15, it's a story of a father who never gives up hope. He's ready to receive his child back with open arms. We can discipline, we can hold accountable, but we never give up on our children. Lastly, dad prays for his children. But if a child refuses to take a nap, are they resisting arrest? <laughs> In Chronicles, 1 Chronicles 29, 19, King David prayed for his son Solomon. And I give unto Solomon, my son, a perfect heart, to keep thy commandments, thy testimonies, and thy statutes to do all things, and to build the palace for which I have made a provision. Children who know without any doubt that their dads pray for them every day own a deep sense of love and security. So that's what I think of our earthly father. So moving on to the perfect father. <clears throat> One thing that we have with God is his patience and kindness never run out. If you've ever felt you've used up whatever patience or kindness your dad once had, you don't have to worry about overextending your heavenly father. In Psalm 103, 17, it says, From everlasting to everlasting, the Lord's love is with those who fear him and his righteousness with their children's children. In Psalm 106, it says, For he is good, his love endures forever. That means not only God's patience and kindness never wear out, but that God's ability to forgive you never wanes either. Psalm 103, 12 assures us, As far as east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. That means your Heavenly Father also never holds a grudge or brings up your past. Number two, God is always approachable. God never has a bad day. He's never in a sour mood. He's never too busy or distracted for his child. When you are in a relationship with the Son, Christ Jesus, you have complete access to your Heavenly Father's ear, his heart, his focused attention. 
Hebrews 4, 16 tells us we can draw near in confidence to the throne of grace so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in a time of need. Furthermore, Psalm 123, 3 tells us God will not let our feet slip because he never slumbers. In Psalm 138, 3, David saying, when I call, you answered me. You greatly emboldened me, letting us know that God is never too busy to hear our cries and come to our rescue. Number three, you will never have to earn his love. Romans 5, 8 tells us God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we are still sinners, Christ died for us. That is unconditional. Sacrificial love that is unlike anything you can experience on this earth. God is a Father who chose to love you, and you didn't do anything to deserve it. Number four, you will never blow it enough to lose his love. Since there was nothing you could do to earn your Heavenly Father's love, there's nothing you can do to lose it. Romans 8, 38 and 39 tells us neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor any else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. In other words, no circumstance, seen or unseen, power, action, person, inaction on your part can separate you from God's love. That's powerful. And that's a promise that only your Heavenly Father has the power to fulfill. God's word promises that even in death, there is no separation from God's love, ever. And that's in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 8. Number 5, he has your very best in mind. It's natural for humans to be selfish and consider themselves before anybody else. Scripture tells us, he who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for all of us, will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? Romans 8, 32. In Matthew 7, 11, Jesus said, If you then are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? God not only has the ability to give you anything you desire, as long as it's good for you, he also knows your situation down the road and what will be best for you in the long run, as well as eternally. He loves you enough to discipline you. You might have a hard time with this, but in Proverbs 3, 11 verse 12 through 12, do not despise the Lord's discipline. Do not resent his rebuke, because the Lord disciplines those he loves. As a father, the son he delights in. Scripture also says, whoever spares the rod hates their children, but one who loves their children is careful to discipline them. Proverbs 13, 24. Have you ever had God refuse to give you something or take something away you love? Trust that your Heavenly Father is either protecting you from something or disciplining you out of love or both. Number seven, his timing is perfect. God does not make mistakes, nor does he forget. And unlike human fathers, his timing is always perfect. When he withholds something from you, it's not necessarily because he's angry or punishing you, or just not listening to the concerns of your heart. Scripture tells us in Psalm 84, 11, no good thing he does withhold from those who walk uprightly. Trust him. Trust what he knows, and trust the process he's allowing you to go through. Trust his timing. Number eight, he gives wisdom generously. James 1, verse 5 says, If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault. It'll be given to you. He gives wisdom generously to all without finding fault. Number nine, he lets you make your own choices. While God has expectations of you, he doesn't disown you or back out of your life when you select a different path. A wise, loving, and patient father, he waits, and he causes all things to work together for good to those who love God and to those who are called according to his purpose, Romans 8, 28. That means when you come back to his best plan for your life, you'll find out it's something that you really wanted also, and you find that he's able to use those mistakes for good in your life from that point on. And lastly, he knows you intimately. It's one of our deepest needs to be intimately known. Yet sometimes we hide who we really are out of fear of rejection or that someone may lose interest in us when they discover what we're really like, warts and all. Scripture says your heavenly Father knows you intimately. In Psalm 139, verse 1 through 3, David said, You have searched me, Lord. You know me. You know when I sit. You know when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out, my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. God knows your thoughts before you think them, your words before you say them. Your actions before you carry them out. And with all that intimate knowledge of you, he continues to love you like the perfect father. So then in summary, I found this little story. It was by Irma Bombeck, and she wrote this. 
When the Lord was creating fathers, he started with a tall frame. An angel standing nearby said, what kind of father is that? If you're going to make children so close to the ground, why do you put fathers up so high? He won't be able to shoot marbles without kneeling. He won't be able to tuck a child in the bed without bending. He won't be able to even kiss a child without stooping. God smiled and said, yes, but if I make him child size, who will the children have to look up to? And when God made the father's hands, they were large. The angel shook his head and said, I don't think you want to make hands like that. Large hands are clumsy. <laughs> they can't manage diaper pins, small buttons, rubber bands on ponytails, or even remove splinters caused by baseball bats. God smiled again and said, I know, but they are large enough to hold everything a small boy empties from his pockets at the end of the day, yet small enough to cut the child's face in his hands. God molded long, slim legs with broad shoulders. The angel nearly had a heart attack. Boy, this is the end of the week, all right. How's he going to pull a child close to him without the kid falling between those legs? God smiled and said, a mother needs a lap, but a father needs strong shoulders to pull a sled. Balance a boy on a, on a bicycle or hold a sleepy head on the way home from the circus. God was in the middle of creating two of the largest feet anyone had ever seen when the angel could just not contain it any longer. That's not fair, he said. Do you honestly think those large boats are going to get out of bed early in the morning when the child cries or walk through a small birthday party without crushing at least three of the guests? Again, God smiled and said, they'll work. You'll see. They'll scare off mice in a summer cabin or leave footprints that will be a challenge to follow. God worked through the night, giving the father a few words, but a firm voice and eyes that saw everything. Finally, almost as an afterthought, he added tears. And then he turned to the angel and said, Now are you satisfied that he can love as much as his mother? The angel was silent. So in summary, yes, God does his love his children, and so should we. And in closing, how does the taco say grace? Let us pray. So let us pray. Dear Father, thank you for all of your blessings. Thank you for all the knowledge that you give us. Please encourage us to follow your word. Help give us the strength to be the fathers that you want us to be. And give our family the love that it deserves. And in your name, we love you, Lord. Amen. So I forgot to read the last part. So this is where we are. Yep, that's okay. I don't have all the jokes. <laughs> Uh, thank you so much, Tim. I know you have blessed us today. Uh, we're going to sing him 279, Faith of Our Fathers, and it's verse 1 and 4, and would you please stand as able? <laughs>
Father God, thank you that we are your children. Thank you that you have adopted us and we can call you Father. Thank you that because of Jesus, we can spend eternity with you, our eternal Father. Thank you for our human fathers. Bless each father that is here today. Bless them with wisdom and strength. Help them to be good fathers. Help them to feel your presence as they parent their children. God, strengthen the faith that our fathers have in you. Help them to teach their children about you. Help them teach their children to have faith in you. Amen. Now let's take a moment and lift up our silent prayers to the Lord. Savior taught us when he said, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as this in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debts. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. Today's affirmation of faith is the traditional Apostles' Creed. Please rise as you are able and join me. As we say together in one voice, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under the Apostles' Father,
to invite everybody out on the front lawn to join us for lemonade, cookies, and great fellowship with the, with the congregation. So now our charge and benediction. May the Lord bless and protect you. May the Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look with favor on you and give you peace. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit.